it's always nice to come in this big room and see a crowd, you know, and, but I know that in the afternoon and our working dates, we shouldn't expect, be expecting many more people. Sorry for the little delay, but I was told that there was a little break and lunch and there is uh, some time that we need actually to climb up on the second floor. My name is Dejan Popovic. Popovic is a very frequent name in our country. And we typically, when we speak, we try to bring only Popovic, but we're not family actually. We're just, it comes that this name is a name that often comes, like Singh in, in India or some other places. Uh, and <clears throat> I am a member of the Academy of Sciences, so I want to welcome you in the name of the Academy of Sciences in which building we are. M my education comes from electrical engineering, where I graduated, and after that, I spent most of my time working in biomedical engineering, or more specifically in rehabilitation engineering. And I have a lot of experience with mobility because I spent considerable time in Canada, in Western Canada, in Edmonton, Alberta. I spent some time in Cleveland. I spent some time in Miami, Florida. I spent some time in Oldborg, Denmark. I spent some time in Copenhagen. When I say some time in total, this is 26 years of experience in different countries. But actually, most of the time that I spent was on the plane in airports in between these places. So I'm very familiar with airports, which I hate. And I traveled just with Delta Airlines two million miles on Lufthansa two million miles. And whenever, whenever someone calls me now to go to China or other places, I says, thank you very much. I did my part of flying. So anyway, mobility is a great thing, and I believe that's an extremely important element in the development of a culture and development of many other things. So it is great that we try to build up. However, I see that there are problems because we are living in a world, I will address some of these issues later on. So we should always be very careful when translating and transferring things from one place to another. Because I remember very well years ago, I built a device that can be used for people after stroke that, so that they can help when they don't have a drop foot. So, you know, people after stroke, their toes are down so they can't walk. And we built a gorgeous device and it has a switch which goes into a shoe. And we thought that's great. And then you go to Japan and there's tatami where you cannot go on with your shoes. So you take down your shoe there is no switch, there is no assistance. And I don't want to mention Africa, where people never saw shoes. So things have to be built and we have to consider that there are different cultures and there are different needs and that in some people, people like to drink you know, mojito, in some other they like to drink shlivovica, and in some other they are very healthy, so they just go with whiskey. So we have to take this into account also when we're talking about education because uh, that comes also from a family and part of education goes from the parents and the family. I'm using more time than I should because a good friend of mine, uh, Pumbashirevic, for whatever reason, uh, uh, called me yesterday and says, cancel my talk because I can't be in Belgrade at that time. So he apologizes for not being here and I'm not criticizing, that just happens. But Vlada Pumbashirevic was rector of our university for about eight years and with the same dedication as he showed today, he dedicated his time to the uh, rector's position. So he did a great job while being there and doing uh, fantastic things. Anyway, we have uh, three people that will be talking today. And this is our program. So you see we have Denis Gillet, who comes from Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And obviously because we are talk he will be talking in French because that's the language and that's part of what we have. And then we have Daniel Sandy Pinheiro and she will be speaking in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, I hope, uh, so that we have this variety. And I'll be speaking in Serbian and using Cyrillic, which shows us how easy it is to do the mobility. <laughs> of course not, this will be all in English so that we can understand what we want to talk, but we will mention some other things. So as you will see, we will cover some aspects that are somewhat connected and some are disconnected, but that's good for a panel. And each of us has about 10 minutes to talk. If we go a little longer, like 45, 
that would be too much, but if we go a minute or two, that would be fine. There's a little bell that I'd be, as a moderator, using this bell. Uh, normally, the animals, they have the bell around the neck, but in my case, they left me to press it with the button. So I'll do that, and uh, I'll talk at the end, and then we will have some time for discussion. So without further, I once more want to welcome you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm very pleased that the Academy then asked me also to participate in this so I can pot potentially learn something about this. Thank you very much. And I will ask Teddy Chalet, who is coming from Ecole Polytechnique, wants to repeat. And he will be talking about blend design thinking activities for research and education with two use cases at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, as mentioned before, I will try to speak in English despite my strong French accent. Sorry for that uh, in advance. So uh, in English, I am from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, uh, usually called uh, EPFL. I'm part of the School of uh, Engineering, and I'm also part of a new center for learning science we have uh, created recently as a bridge between university and schools, especially to support the transition towards digitalization uh, as early as possible uh, in, uh, in schools. I'm also a co-founder of what we call the Swiss EdTech Collider. It's uh, an accelerator and an incubator for uh, EdTech startups coming from the, the EPFL. We started uh, two years and a half ago and we already have uh, 80 uh, startups building solutions related to uh, digital education. So there is a lot of uh, needs and opportunities around that, and we are covering a broad range of, uh, of application. I have created also myself my own uh, non-profit association for the promotion of digital education with one of the platform I will uh, mention uh, today, but I am not there to advertise it, and it's a non-profit one, so I'm not trying to sell you uh, uh, anything. I'm also involved uh, in a big uh, open uh, initiative um, aiming at promoting a STEM education uh, at school with, uh, with online uh, labs, so with uh, open educational uh, resources for, uh, for that, and I will briefly talk about it in the little 10 minutes um, I have got uh, today. So uh, the title of the, the panel today is the role of uh, academic mobility and digital tools in research and education. I, I will highlight the role of digital tools in education because I cannot cover everything uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes. So personally, I see digital tools as an enabler for change in academia, as an enabler for changes in the way we uh, teach and the students learn in the pedagogy but it's also an enabler for the development, not only of core competencies, but also transversal skills. You cannot develop digital literacy uh, of, with the students if you don't have access to information. You cannot really support collaborative learning if you don't use technology. So having you know, technology, digital technology, in the classroom is really important to support you know, the transition towards more, uh, you know, transversal competences uh, in, uh, in education. So when I talk about digital tools, I'm not talking about supporting online education. It's really, you know, about leveraging on the digital ecosystem, which is everywhere around us and which is the ecosystem in which the students we currently have at universities uh, were born. They are bringing that with them. They are used to use technology and they do not understand why we don't take advantage of that uh, in the school. So it's really about blending the digital and the physical uh, solutions we have around us to be more uh, effective uh, in education. So we uh, offer also open educational uh, platform and uh, content and resources uh, to support uh, this, uh, this transition, because having just tools is not enough. You need to have digital resources which are actually supporting uh, education. And if you just have a few to uh, tools and resources, but no way 
to simplify and make easy for the teachers themselves to create those tools, then we get stuck. Okay, so we have nice uh, objectives and nice idea, but we, we, we cannot really enable uh, the, the, the transition. So, and obviously, uh, we do all that, keeping in mind the sustainable development goals, which have been mentioned a lot uh, up to now, uh, trying also to frame the curricula towards, you know, uh, tackling the challenges we are facing in the society. So, it's a lot about blending many uh, different things, blending the objectives of education, blending the modalities, the type of activities we do uh, with the students in the classroom, blending the tools, you know, we have to be able to use many different tools. We should not be stuck with a single platform from a single commercial provider. Otherwise, there is no way to uh, really share and to blend the skills between the core and the transversal uh, skill. So really, it's about being holistic to really tackle the complexity of the challenges uh, we are facing ourselves, but especially the students we are uh, we are currently training. This means that we have to, you know, deconstruct all the silos we have in academia. Uh, we have to deconstruct the silos in terms of also tech, uh, platform for learning platform in school. So there is a lot of things to deconstruct. And I think it's the challenge uh, we have to tackle together. So I just put back this sustainable development gold map because when I am uh, showing that to my student, they are asking what it is, you know. And I think we are really we have the responsibility to talk more and more about that with them. Obviously, we focus a lot on uh, developing the better uh, quality of education. And I think, you know, developing open education and resources participating to this improvement of the quality, because when you start to share the resources you are building, you have to make sure that they are pretty good. Okay, so it's helping. And I think the main outcome of the development of the MOOCs uh, recently has been in the quality of the educational resources we are sharing with the students. Because when you put something online visible to everybody, you better have to do it well. Obviously, with the accessibility of the resources on a digital uh, way, uh, you are also contributing to reducing inequality, if you are careful, and we have a project to develop STEM education in, uh, in Africa with digital tools, and it's uh, working pretty well, but you have to make sure that there is not a technological divide because of the accessibility to the network and the resources. So everything has to be done carefully, but it has a huge potential. Obviously, in that framework, you have to partner uh, with others to develop resources, to develop platform, to uh, you know, uh, train teachers and uh, you know, adapt the methodology. And this is contributing a lot to uh, innovation. And this is also one of the objectives of the uh, transition we are working uh, currently on. So the platform we are developing, and I encourage you to use it because it's open access, it's free. Uh, it's really a platform which is there to help any teacher to create themselves uh, their uh, open educational resources or even to co-create resources with, uh, with colleagues because it's always better when you preach for collaborative learning that you are all also able to collaborate to do uh, teaching and to build resources. But also, you know, not anyone is, a, is an editor or creator, so we also offer the opportunity for, to people to personalize resources done by, uh, by others. And it's not about creating resources, but obviously it's about using them for learning. So the platform is also supporting uh, learning activities, we embed learning analytics in the resources, so it's helping a lot also for self-reflection, which is one of the transversal skills we would like to develop. The name of the platform, we call it GRASP. I like the meaning of GRASP in English because it's meaning at the same time bringing things and people together and also understanding. So it's really the purpose of the platform to bring resources together to help understand, to help uh, also sharing uh, knowledge. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, we use that platform, as I mentioned before, uh, to uh, produce uh, open education resources for STEM education at school, but it's not uh, limited to, to that. So it's an open access platform for open education resources and also for open learning. So just two examples uh, I would like to mention quickly. I don't know why I'm in the 10 minutes I, I was allocated, but... Uh, I think it's not about only about talking, it's about trying to implement things at our own level. 
and to see how we can impact, you know, uh, the competencies of the of the students. So we have done, um, or personally, I have done two uh, uh, implementation in my school with my students at the at EPFL. One uh, is an act in an action at the bachelor level, and it was really a change in the curricula of all the students coming for the first year at EPFL. And we organize a class on global issue, uh, on global issue on communication, transportation, energy, health, and nutrition, just to show to the students starting engineering school all the domains where their future contribution will be uh, essential uh, to tackle the sustainable development goals. And they are integrating both societal and technical dimensions. And it's not only that, but we are teaching that class together between colleagues from engineering and colleagues from humanities, and we are in facing the students together. And only a little part of the class is uh, used for expository uh, you know, lectures, but most of the time is the time is used for debates and also for design thinking activity, uh, design thinking activity and I will mention that uh, after. The other experience I am running is in a class for computer science, which was initially organized uh, at EPFL at the master level, the final year, to uh, teach the uh, students from computer science how to design social media platform uh, of the future. And we decided that to really show them all the dimensions we should invite also students from business and art. And now they are carrying out teamwork activities uh, for half of a semester uh, together between computer scientists, uh, business uh, students, and art students. And we, tell, we told them design solutions in the direction of you know, tackling the sustainable development goals. So don't do the next uh, you know, dating platform. Just work on solutions for ed tech, knowledge sharing, ICT for development, humanitarian technology, or ELs. And they start, they open their mind, and they are really uh, able to create solutions in that direction. So we implement the Dijon thinking process in that framework to enable them to do their teamwork. So it's not about you know, pushing one process on, on one design process rather than another, but it's really about you know, teaching processes rather than teaching core competences and or, or only core competencies and content. And the main message in that framework is that the teachers and the teaching assistant, they are not giving you the solution. They are just here with you to help you to find your own solutions. And don't take the solutions we have developed because we have killed the planet, our generation, with our own solution, so you better have to do something else. Okay. And the platform, just to show you what we do with the platform, the platform they have is exactly matching the, the process. So we can load templates in the platform where you get you know, uh, folders which are shared by the, the students and they can integrate content, they can edit documents, they can even put uh, you know, interactive web application and they can you know, go through the process uh, the way they want uh, to, um, to develop their, uh, their solution. And there is no need to call an administrator you know, at the beginning of the semester to create a space. Anyone can go in the, in the grass platform, create a space, either being a student or a teacher, invite colleagues or invite teacher or invite TA if they want, and start to do the, 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 the creation uh, process following their own you know, uh, path. And at any time, they can switch between the, the creation uh, space and the visualization and presentation space because communication is also one of the important uh, aspects we would like to promote through the, through the platform. They can even export at any uh, stage uh, PDF or ebook with the content they have currently created. So just to show you uh, the outcome of this design thinking process, in the global issue class, this is the best uh, poster which has been created by a group of uh, five and you see uh, also, the students we have in that class, we have students from mechanical engineering, computer science, communication, physics, and so on. They are all participating. And they had to um, choose uh, a global issue, show that this is a, a, a real global problem uh, requiring coordinated action and uh, having interdisciplinary dimension. And they have to propose solutions, not only an analysis of the problem or diagnosis of the problem, but just bringing 
ideas about potential solutions, obviously they will not solve all the problem of the planet, but um, they, they can show that. In the, in the social media class, uh, those are the two winners uh, of the, the class of last year. One application uh, to uh, help uh, people to have a healthy uh, you know, food uh, you know, pattern, and another one to uh, you know, check uh, fact, and especially tweets from uh, Trump, uh, you know, uh, with uh, tools to help them for that. And everything was based on uh, uh, self-evaluation, and that's my last slide. Uh, at the beginning, everybody was proposing a topic to be tackled during the semester with the team. The best one were uh, selected, evaluated by the, by the students themselves. The 10 best one uh, became the seed for uh, the teamwork and a group. So the, the winners somehow were selected as team leader and they were able to you know, form the group of the people with the constraints to have people from art and business in all the groups. And then uh, they produce uh, the design prototypes and then they wrote a report. The reports were evaluated also by the peers. And I can tell you that when the students know that they, they will be evaluated by their colleagues and not by the professors, they do a really, really good job. So I really encourage you to try that. And at the end also, because communication is important, we ask them to pitch that like if they would uh, pitch in front of an investor to get money to really implement the solution. And uh, also it was also uh, selected by the, by the people. Peer evaluation is very helpful, but it's challenging. You have to find the right pattern to do it. So we were always do saying that if the correlation between our own evaluation and the evaluation of the class was good, then we will increase the weight of the evaluation of the students. And the last few years, we had the weight of the students, you know, uh, being two thirds of the grade and the, weight, uh, the grade of the teacher being uh, one third. So this is the quick survey of the way we try to, you know, implement digital tools for changes uh, at EPFL in a few in a few uh, classes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have a time for one quick question. The rest we leave for discussion. Any mm -hmm. direct questions now? To the end? Maybe? No, no, we leave for the end. But yeah. if there is one question, that, okay. Uh, thank you. If you want to take for sure, we move to the next talk. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'll talk about um, this, the power externality concept related to the topic the, that we are talking this session. But actually, this topic is a proposition. I'll present to you um, some questions, some concerns about the externality concept that actually this uh, concept is used in welfare economic theory since the 1920. But I in my proposition is introduce this concept of internality, externality with power relations. So that's why the, the talk, the, the name that I put in my topic, power externality and educational governance influence of power externalities on academic mobility and research. In a general speaking, externality is a term used in welfare economic theory to describe the costs or benefits incurred by the, a third part, not directly related to the matter, like pollution, okay? So I'll try to relate the externality concept, as I told you, with the academic mobility. So let's define, it's a proposition of, about this concept related with the topic of academic mobility. Please allow me to read the concept. Power externality is a situation where the interconnected social power relations jointly with political economic business cycles and governance agendas affect a third part, not directly related. In this case, we may consider the power externality related to educational policies concerning academic mobility, 
research and development. This is the power externality triangle. It's a proposition that I made before and is published at Cadmus Journal of WAAS. So you can see the social power relations as, a, as the main head of a power triangle that uh, considers together governance and business cycle topics. Uh, continue with, the, with this matter related to academic mobility and the discussion that I, I will propose about brain drain and brain gain. Uh, just to uh, describe a little bit more, because this, this presentation is, is an abstract, and so small, uh, power relations are related to, to institutional power, informal power, and potential power. Uh, governance is related, in generally, generally speaking, in, about, in public management and public budget policies, or, or and so on. And business cycles are related to economic and political cycles. This is. Uh, um, please allow allow me one more, once more to to describe my theoretical proposition, and I will read again. Uh, negative power externality education could be considered as a situation where, although the government and the society are conscious about the dilemmas involving social policies, because the flexibility and interchangeability between power relations, jointly with the political, economic, business cycles and governance agendas, the best choice in terms of educational policies and research and development matters are not fulfilled as expected in society is harmed. Of course, there is positive power externalities. It's, we, it, I'll, I'll describe I'll, the term in the next uh, slide. But let's see again uh, the argument that I put here. Uh, my argument is that since government and so civil society need to perform negotiations for educational policies, the governance agenda is inter interconnected with politics and business cycles, and the social powers relations are the arena that governs these uh, relations, as I told you. Likewise, a positive poly, uh, power externality can occur. The difference is, is at the end of the description of the proposition. Um, in this case, uh, the best choice in terms of educational policies and research and development are more likely to be achieved and the society is benefited. So, positive power externality is a good outcome for the society as a whole since it brings social and educational improvements in general. But what, what are my concerns about power externalities and the uh, academic mobility and brain drain and the brain gain aspects? So the questions that, that I thought, and these are only questions, I don't have answers, just for reflection. Uh, the questions are, could academic mobility and research and development policies be aspects of power externalities in a negative or a positive sense? In which ways? And could brain drain and brain gain be aspects of power externalities for whom? Uh, considering this, I researched some topics, some papers related to this field. Uh, I put three papers. They, uh, of course, there is no time to explore the, the, them, but let's see this paper. Brain drain and brain gain and mobility, theories and prospective methods. And then I, I, um, I stressed some concerns about the, this, this, this paper. Uh, let's see, uh, the first one. A country suffers an outflow of its educational elite on a scale treating the needs of national development in the long term. Uh, brain gain, uh, on the other hand, the, in, the, in, a, in a contrastive term, brain gain, sorry, the first one is related to brain drain aspect. 
The second one is related to brain gain aspect. Gain aspect. Brain gain is relatively new, according to the authors. It was coined in the 90s to describe collectively the attempts, efforts, programs, and projects aimed to draw scientific workers to a given country. So let's see and another point of view. And these authors point some other aspects of brain drain and the brain gain. Uh, the, the phenomenon concerned to escape, to migration, uh, and the others concerns, uh, the, 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 the aspects concerning uh, uh, research and development too, and the, the main, how can I say, the main, main findings of these articles is that the, it's about the future, the future of the comprehensive research university in Europe. So this paper, I, I brought the paper if you want, I have a copy, it's not mine, they are not my friend, uh, friends of mine, I just researched. Uh, we, we can see about this, when, this, uh, this other paper. This paper is called International Academic Mobility Towards a Concentration of the Minds in Europe. Um, as I, as I told you, the, the, con the, the main topic of this paper is, the, is, a, is about concentration of research and development in, in Europe and the costs and benefits related to this. That's why, uh, the, 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 that's why the questions that I put about power externalities. Uh, because power externalities are related to the costs of benefits. When a country invest in research and development, there is a cost and a benefit. But how about other, we, we the, the nations start a kind of racing, or uh, that, uh, that leads to the nations less developed to suffer brain drain. What can occur? According to the, other, the first paper, could be many phenomena uh, related to this, to this main pheno principal phenomenon, that is research and development attracting. Could be migration, escaping, being drained. And if you, one country wants to develop research and development, of course, it, it, it will suffer positive power externality, but it can, um, it can, it can, it, it make, can make to, to the other, the, uh, another country, in a peripheral country, can suffer negative power externality because uh, its brains are being drained. So uh, the main, the main, um, the main concerns about this, uh, this relation, this, this proposition is, in which scale, in which ways, uh, for whom uh, positive or negative power externalities can occur? And what will be the, the, the final, the racing, the final, the final of this racing for different levels of development uh, of the nations uh, around the globe? So if you, there is, there are power externalities, and in economic theory, power externality is considered a market failure. If it, there is a market failure, economic theory, orthodox economic theory indeed, um, tells us that uh, could be intervention. What kind of intervention? Could be a government intervention, uh, uh, mean through pub public policies, could be private, could will be private market solutions, it could be voluntary collective solutions. So these three points of solutions follow the, the power triangle that I am proposing because government solutions or public policy are related to the governance. Private market solutions could be related to the business cycles, economic business, political and economic business cycles, and governance too. And voluntary collective action solutions could be related to the social power and the, the, in, in, in its three forms of existence, institutional power, informal power, and potential power. So when uh, I finish the presentation with the same questions, 
okay? Uh, could academic mobility and the research and development policies be aspects of power externalities, positive or negative? You, and you, you, we must see that if it for there, if it there will there are positive power externality for one for a country that develop research and and uh, that the research in a large scale. This positive externality could be a negative externality to other country or the city that that suffers brain drain. How? Uh, so that's why I mention uh, um, uh, a race. A race for what? To be what? To cause E and, and this race could be could provide a kind of, uh, if we consider a market failure, this race could provide uh, solutions to this market failure. As I told you, public policies, private solutions, or voluntary collective actions in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for one quick question directly related to the talk. If not, then we can move to the last presentation that I will give, uh, which I will actually change a little bit after I heard uh, these two presentations. But I want to quickly uh, get you through some of these slides that I prepared for today. Uh, well, we, this is the top title of my talk. And what I would like to emphasize, and you will see this in two of my slides, that many problems exist that we typically don't discuss. So if you look into programs and you look on the Euro EU site and you look into other elements, then in most cases, the positive effects are shown and demonstrated, which of course, being positive is important. So if you look into the activities, key activities that are supported in last years in Europe are mobility projects, in the field of education, training, and youth. Meaning, we want to have students going from one place to another in order to learn about different approaches, different techniques, and develop different skills. In the same time, we have some of the joint master programs and also some PhD programs, which are funded, and obviously without funding, nothing works, because we are living in a world where money drives the world. So, if you look into one thing, which I will just make an example, for example, I read and listen news in uh, Serbia, and I know that we, are, we have one of the best economies in the world these days. So everything that could be developed in is done in the most appropriate way. So I'm expecting a big wave of experts coming from Silicon Valley, UK, and other places to come to Serbia to learn how actually you should run business and how you can manage in order to improve the economy in these countries that do not have very good economy like United States, UK, Germany, and France. So we should transfer this knowledge, but that is still an idea that I have, but maybe someone will, will take it over one day. Um, at the same time, we heard this brain, gain brain drain. People from our country who are experts in our mind, they leave the country and they don't come back. So I don't think that this is mobility. In the same time, brain drain for a country like Serbia or Romania or Bulgaria or Hungary is a brain gain for someone else, if someone else knows how to use that. Not necessarily that someone who is clever here will actually bring this knowledge and integrate it in another place. But without going into these details where I think we have to improve for the benefit of the world and for the benefits of young people is we have all of these elements which I, I greatly appreciate. I think that students should learn and should see how the things are done in a different way. There's a very nice saying, the baby never cries in mother hands. So when the mother takes the baby and is crying, the baby stops crying. That's very much like with a student. So one student who knows very well how to operate in his own environment should see and learn how it operates in another world how it is to think in a different way. So what needs to be done is people have to enhance their uh, intercultural awareness. They have to uh, find a way how to participate in a society at large. 
they have to increase their motivation how to work. So these are all important elements. And for some of that, mobility is very important. At the same time, students who move, they are providing benefits to the organizations which are there. And these benefits are definitely that an institution which receives students who come with some knowledge, who come with some experience, who bring this knowledge, that can affect the capacity to operate, that increase the collaboration between institutions, that can provide more attractive programs because you can see that something is starting to be popular in other places. It can be more dynamic, and obviously the most important thing is everyone is looking for excellent students and excellent academic staff. Excellent meaning someone that is contributing to what you do. Excellent is difficult to define because it depends very much in the uh, team that you're playing. So when you look into sports arena, then you can see uh, that this excellence means a lot. There are some football club, as far as I know, Barcelona, Real Madrid. So if you look in Real Madrid or in Barcelona, there are only Spanish players playing. Or you look into some uh, teams in UK, there's only people from UK. I think that you are not changing your faces, so I'm surprised. How many players are actually from the original country? Almost none. Why? Mobility. Which drives, the, who drives that mobility? Money. So in order to have good mobility in students, we have to provide a very important thing that the student can see what is the benefit that comes out of that. And I'm not quite sure that this is actually there. So in the same time, there is a much larger mobility which has many more effects when you have staff, academic, moving back and forth. Academic staff, they, if they go to another place and they bring whatever they do, and they bring something back, that is definitely increasing the capacity of the institution, and that's definitely increasing everything. In this country, we tried once to put into the law a couple of years ago that we cannot elect a professor who has not spent on another institution at least one year. I was one of the proposers, and it was not accepted. And I don't believe that someone should be a professor, if he has never had a chance to see how things operate in a, in a different world. Not necessarily in another country even, but at least in another institution, even in his own country. So when I'm talking about this language barrier, I intentionally put this slide here. So people who are from this country, Serbian, they have no problem in seeing this. But I will tell you what this is. This is one of the panels that was on an exhibition which was closed yesterday, dedicated to the memory of Professor Rajko Tomovic, a member of Academy of Sciences. And what this shows here is something that is history of robotics. But obviously, if a student or a visitor of this exhibition comes to the exhibition and, and try to read that, I'm sure that they will have problems. However, if I only change that, I can see that this starts to be much easier to understand. So there was a development of an artificial hand in 1963. And this hand was used to develop artificial intelligence at MIT in 1968. And if you see these two lines, you can see that in Yugoslavia or Serbia, there was a first class robotics research 60 years ago. Because this was the first multifunctional hand ever made. So one thing that is important is that students who come can communicate with other students. But this is a technical issue, so this is very easy that you can understand. But that's another uh, image, another panel there. And what you see in this panel is, and most of you will have a problem in that. Again, people from this country will know. If you look at the picture, the image, you can see in the middle this is a very famous President Tito. President Tito who was ruling this country for 300 years. And uh, while he was doing that, there were many pictures that were taken of him. On his left side, there is Professor Rajko Tomovic. And Rajko Tomovic was dedicated to lead the country. And he was representing the Society for Electronics Communication. And they were negotiating in 1968, 1965, sorry, how things should be developed in technology. And obviously, again, with the Serbian language, you have a problem. 
And I intentionally did this in a different way to make it even more complex for our speaker here. So we don't have to translate it always in English. There are many more people who are speaking Spanish in the world than English. But somehow English is there to compress our minds. But we can do that also in, in uh, Portuguese. I'm not quite sure that my Portuguese is good enough, but at least you can understand. But it's not only that you understand what is in the text. It's important to know another thing. One should know how this affected the development of technology in our country. So one should know, first of all, that without the decision of Tito, nothing was done. Tito decided, for example, that we have six republics and everything has to be done in every republic. So our experts tried to convince him that if you want to do something which is good, you should integrate efforts. And he, this is right. That's exactly what's happening in the world these days. So only with integrated efforts you can reach whatever. You need a whole team in order to win the game. But one, when studying this from the historic point of something, should know what was the situation and then you understand. So in this mobility issue, we have a problem not only within language, but also with cultural differences to understand how it was, where it is. So to know what's the problem in Catalonia, to know what's the problem in the Basque country, to know what's the problem in Crete, and it's not just reading newspaper lines in order to do that. So we are coming into what is called Industry 4.0, and that's where we are. We are living now in a digital world, and many things are very transparent. The only problem with this transparency is that the information that is available to us, in most cases, is not original. It is processed. So the information that you get when you press the button is already something that someone arranged that you can read it easier or that you can change your mind. So to finish my short talk, still in time, I think that mobility is a great value to the society, a great value. But I don't believe that it is transferable if you have rich countries and poor countries, countries that have well-developed economy and non-well-developed country. And we have to have special methods how we can guarantee that this mobility will provide best positive effects. And here I'll stop. Thank you. Now we have time for short discussion, five minutes, so. Questions, comments, killing us? Professor. In, in our country? Everywhere. I thought you were thinking about Trump, but... No, you, you finished with money driven. Yes. Money is also driven by somebody. Uh, in a way it is. This is connected. But these, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not trying to insist on it because I don't want to bring politics into this. But money is an important element. Without that, you cannot have an economy that operates. And without there is no education. Now, one of the questions that I have, but this is my personal view, I'm not quite sure that some of people who have money are interested into people having curiosity and knowledge or having people who are very good listeners. Yes? Thank you. Um, one question that comes to mind is the role of competition in modern academia, in contemporary institutions, in particular
I have an answer, but maybe you want to answer that. Uh, personally, I think that you know, in the in the development of uh, of transversal skills, you know, the collaboration aspect is important to show that to the student that we achieve more if we work together rather than being, uh, you know, competing with with each other. Uh, but obviously, you know, the, the way we manage universities, as you said, is, uh, is like soccer teams. So, uh, and, and this, personally, I, I do not have a solution to propose, but I think we, we should remind our, you know, management always that they could do things a bit differently. Uh, I think even in the soccer teams, you have people, you know, uh, you know, uh, adding points and you have people you know on the back of the field you know making sure that things are working well so we we, we should not only learn the, the competition aspect of the the soccer but there is also a lot of uh, collaboration so maybe it's just the emphasis we put on different aspects of it so. okay you you had a comment yes I think one of the goals is about reducing inequality. So, uh, one of the goals is to reduce it, you know. So, it does not. The, the, we, we should reach a point where there will be no brain drain or gain because we, we, if we develop well the economy and the society, we should, you know, reach an equilibrium between countries. So, uh, but it's long term, obviously. Uh, I don't think that, as such, the way they were designed, the, the, there was this question embedded in the in the goals. It was about you know the general reduction of poverty. So, so uh, we could uh, understand that uh, the imagination, sustainable goal, could be just uh, a fiction. Utopia. And the poor country that invests in that person loses. So it's against this, this theoretical goals. Oh, so okay. I don't think so. Yeah, but you so go ahead. I mean, this is an extremely complex, but that's what is happening. I mean, that's what we're witnessing right now. So the competition that we have right now is making a pyramid where you have centers that are rich by minds and rich by money. And that is the case. But maybe, in, this is just a, a question of time. And since the time is uh, unlimited, in a couple of million years, we're going to reach we're going to reach an another level where we'll discuss that. Okay. At the end of your presentation, uh, presentation, you said that uh, in a case of different economic levels, academic abilities need special management. Absolutely. What do you mean? Maybe some ideas. I can give you a direct example. So. If you compare a country like Serbia, uh, where the, in average people earn almost a little more than 400 euro per month, which is excellent money if you know how to spend it uh, and you don't need to buy anything. But if you move to another country, so you do not have personal resources, people in this country, they even don't understand how much you would have to pay for an apartment. So if a student from Serbia goes to Paris, this student has absolutely no idea what are the minimum costs to survive in this country. So for a student from this place to go to another place is really problematic. Now, of course, you have families who can support that. And you may have some kind of a stipend, but that's not necessarily the case. So, but that's not the only problem. If you look into how we run projects in countries that are not very, I mean, Serbia is not the only country. 
I mean, we, we, here I know rules, but it's not much different in Croatia or in Bulgaria or Romania, European countries. So you get projects. And if you have a project which is in UK or France or Netherlands, you have money that you can spend for travels, you have money that you can spend for equipment, for instrumentation, for hiring some. Here, you don't have anything. You have a personal income. So there's a completely different way of thinking. So it is very difficult for a person, for an undeveloped poor country, to go into another country and to spend some time and be and integrate into this other country. It's not only to go there, but actually to become a part of that country. That's the problem. Now, if someone who has money comes here, then that's much easier. That is, you know, but the question is why a student coming from a good university, what are the interests? There are some labs that we have, and there are some labs in general in undeveloped countries that are excellent, but that's a very low number. So there's not very much interest of people coming from other countries to come here, except for fun and learning about culture and maybe learning some languages, which is in, uh, uh, but that, that's not it. So it, it's very difficult to imagine that. And to, I don't want to take too much of our time and we have to move to the next session because we are late. But we are trying to speak here uh, all, something which uses English, English words. And we consider this is English language. But I work in the fields of the domain of disability. All of us who are not native English-speaking people, we are basically disabled in the world of native English-speaking people. Everything that we write is not appropriate and correct. When people read what we wrote, they will often say, yes, you used English words, but that's not the language. So that's a problematic issue. There are countries in Europe, Spain, France, Italy, where many, many, have no clue and they don't intend to use English. So there's another barrier in that. But if there is any urgent question, on the side of that, I think on your question that we are with these numbers and only looking into numbers, we are reaching low because numbers are not the best representative and we have to, you, you have much better measures how to measure that. Other questions? Thank you very much. If we use your time in any effective way, I'm